folks after this uh, meeting. But before I introduce Jenna, I would uh, encourage everyone to keep their mics off. And uh, Jenna will be presenting for the first 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, and then we are going to open it up to conversations. We are going to open it up to your questions and you will have one-on-one -on -one time. And I think we have enough time today to, to give you one-on-one -on -one time with Jenna. But I will I mention this again in the end, please try to keep your questions to one per person so that everybody gets a shot at uh, talking to Jenna and seeking her counsel. So with that, please meet Jenna Schlintz. She's an experienced HR professional who specializes in employment-based immigration and US immigration law, especially H-1B. She has a strong background in immigration processes and has extensive knowledge of visa procedures and provides technical consultations on immigration policies. Uh, she's very compassionate and uh, her data-driven strategies have made her an extremely valuable asset in the company that she works in. And I cannot wait for her to become a LinkedIn influencer and a top voice in immigration, helping us immigrant folks. So with that, Jenna, it is all you. Thank you so much, Aditi. I am just so thrilled to be here and to be speaking with all of you. And I'm I'm honored that we have people that want to listen to me talk all about the H-1B. And I know that a lot of you on the phone are really looking towards fast-tracking your path towards becoming a permanent resident. And that's a great goal. But like Aditi said, you know, it's it's really important that you also look at other options just in case your EB1 path, that fast faster path doesn't pan out the way that you hoped it would be. So it's always great to have knowledge and uh, the information that you need for what is an alternative path. And that's that's really what we're here to talk about today. I'm going to um, share more about what the H-1B is, um, things that you can do, things uh, what's in your control, what's not in your control, and and we'll go from there. So, of course, disclaimer, this information that I'm presenting today is for informational purposes only. I highly recommend that you connect with a, an experienced immigration attorney to discuss your specific needs based on your history or um, em employment experience and, and just your life and your goals in general. So today we're going to talk about what is the H-1B and what's the hype? Um, why is it such the top of mind for so many people? What is the H-1B lottery? So what is the H-1B petition assembly process look like? What are requests for evidence? Evidence also you'll hear it referred to as an RFE. Some speed bumps you might see along the way and then Honestly, I didn't know where to put this topic, so I'm just going to shove it at the back. Applying and interviewing. Okay, so first is first. What is the H-1B and why all the hype about it? So the H-1B, the actual definition of it is a non-immigrant visa that grants employment authorization to foreign national professionals to work in the United States. Non-immigrant means that it's temporary, means that you have intent to leave the United States at the conclusion or before the conclusion of the visa validity. So non-immigrant means temporary, immigrant means permanent. So you'll hear the permanent residency also referred to as an immigrant visa because that's permanent as permanent residency says. So the requirements for an H-1B are really broad. It requires a bachelor's degree or the U.S. equivalent of one if you earned your bachelor's outside the U.S. And you, re you need a valid job offer from a U.S. company for a specialty occupation that requires a bachelor's degree. And a lot of people ask, well, what is a specialty occupation? It really is a, an occupation that in order to be successful in, you need that bachelor's degree. So if, let's say, you're going in for um, you're you're applying for an engineer position. Most engineering positions would require that you have a bachelor's degree or higher. 
that would be considered a specialty occupation because the minimum requirements for a bachelor's degree. So talking about the pros and cons, let's talk about the cons first, get, the, get those out of the way, and then we can focus on the pros. So the cons really, the first one is that lottery. Um, so the Immigration and Nationality Act in 1990 uh, put a limit to the number of H-1B visas that the government can dole out per fiscal year. And every year it's held in spring. Um, and as people have said, or I've said anyway, the government is behind the times throughout the, or, or since 1990, the limit uh, really has not changed. So even though we have consistently seen a large number of applicants for the lottery, the number of visas that are available has not changed. So in order to calculate your chances of being selected, you take the total number of people that have entered, and then you divide it by the number of visas that are available. And at first in 1990, it was 65,000. We're at 85,000 now, and it's definitely not enough. Definitely not enough. So odds vary year to year based on the number of folks that have entered. So when you receive your H-1B, um, there is a total maximum stay or maximum limit to the H-1B of six years. It is granted in three-year increments. So your first H-1B is valid for three years, you would file an extension for an additional three years. I have a little asterisk there because there is a way to eliminate that six-year max stay so that you can continue to extend your H-1B indefinitely or until you receive your green card. Uh, the H-1B is bound to the information in the labor conditions application, also referred to as the LCA. And that is a um, application that is submitted with the Department of Labor by your employer that really lists out your employment, um, like the terms and conditions of your employment. So for example, working at Pepsi as a software engineer, making X amount of money, um, you're performing work on behalf of Pepsi in, in Montana. So it covers employer, location where the work is performed, title, job duties, and salary, and then benefits as well. So we are telling the Department of Labor that we are want to employ this individual. Here are the terms and conditions of employment. That's the LCA. And that's what the HMP is tied for, tied to. And then lastly, there's not an automatic path to permanent residency. It's not like you're on H-1B for six years and then you'll automatically get a green card. That's not a benefit that um, the H-1B provides. So, all right, now let's talk about the good things about the H-1B. So it's a dual intent visa and that is huge. What that means is Although this is a non-immigrant visa, meaning again, it's temporary, you have intent to exit the US, you still have ties back to your home country or someplace outside the US, you have the ability to simultaneously work towards becoming a permanent resident or work towards that immigrant visa being permanent. So there are certain visas that don't have dual intent. And if that individual on a visa that does not offer dual intent also tries to go down the path of permanent residency, USCIS is going to flag that and there will be issues. But the great thing about the H-1B is no scrutiny by USCIS. Even though it's temporary, you can work towards becoming a permanent resident simultaneously. I mentioned earlier broad requirements, really just your bachelor's degree or the U.S. equivalent in a specialty occupation that requires a minimum of a bachelor's degree. You can port your H-1B to different employers. So again, let's take our Pepsi example. You're working for Pepsi, they filed their H-1B, they told the Department of Labor, here are the terms and conditions of 
the employment, and now you accepted a job offer with Coke. Coke is going to file an H-1B petition on your behalf, and it's going to be considered a change of employment or change of employers. It's really the same process, same application process as just checking a different box. And then they're going to go through that whole process. They'll get it approved, and then you can go work for Coke. So it's transferable, which is really helpful. And then uh, lastly, but just as important, you can extend certain benefits to your spouse and children that are eligible spouse and children. So let's say you have um, a spouse and children that were born in India. You could uh, petition for them to be a dependent on your H-1B. They would receive what's called an H-4 visa, which would allow them to enter and live in the U.S. pursuant to that primary H-1B which is super helpful for a lot of people. All right, now let's talk about the lottery. Uh, this is just a rough outline of what the path looks like and the main markers throughout. So one thing I wanna call out is that the US government fiscal year is October 1st through September 30th. So when, take for example, this past lottery in March, it's conducted in 2023, but it's for fiscal year 2024, okay? So keep that in mind. And I'm gonna talk about each one of these milestones. Okay, so in early March, um, your employer or authorized representative or an attorney that, or firm that is working on behalf of your employer will submit one registration per H-1B applicant. So, and the information that they need just to get your name in that bucket is pretty basic. Your name, date of birth, uh, where, where you were born, where you're a citizen of, passport number, pretty basic information. Then the employer will pay the non-refundable $10 fee, um, which then you'll get a confirmation number that you've been officially entered into the lottery. Now there is chatter within uh, the, the immigration um, community that USCIS may increase that registration fee pretty substantially to avoid any fraudulent registrations. And when I say fraudulent registrations, that would be like, um, I'm, I'm Pepsi and I register a DT for five different positions within Pepsi, that would be considered fraudulent. So it's to deter some shady business stuff there. The registration window is open for about two weeks. And one thing I wanna call out on that is um, to know that if you're registered at the beginning of those two weeks or at the end of those two weeks, it doesn't matter, your, uh, your chances of being selected are just the same. So um, whether it's right away when that window opens or in the middle or towards the end, as long as you get your registration in there, you're good. You've got the same odds as anybody else. So what can you do in this situation? Um, when you are authorized reset representative, the firm, your employer, whoever's entering the registration on your behalf, when they ask for information, um, get it to them as soon as possible so that they have everything that they need. Um, and then just know that um, a little extra patience will be necessary during this time, especially that two-week window when registration opens up. If your employer is working with a firm, then your employer is not their only client. And that two-week registration window is a crazy mad time they may not have time to uh, respond to a lot of questions, emails, calls, things like that. They've got your name, they've got your information, they're gonna get you registered. So just exercise just a smidge of patience during that time, it'd be awesome. Okay, end of March, early April is when the actual lottery happens. So USCIS says it's a computer generated random selection process. Um, I have no idea how sophisticated or unsophisticated it is. Um, what I have in my head, which I know is not accurate, but I'm like, oh, it's probably just a big hat 
somebody writes my name on a piece of paper and throws it in a hat and somebody else picks it, it's got to be more, more sophisticated than that. Um, but that's just what I have in my head. Anyways, there are one of four different uh, results of the lottery. So selected, that's self-explanatory. You were selected in the lottery, congrats. They're submitted, which means that you haven't officially been selected, but you haven't officially not been selected either. And with that um, result, it means that should USCIS decide to hold a second selection, a section, second lottery, then you may have a chance to be selected. I do tell my clients, you know, manage your expectations, don't get your hopes up because one, you don't know if USCIS is gonna have a second, third or fourth, whatever lottery. And if they do, um, you know, we don't know how many are going to be entered in that second one. Um, so we can't tell the odds. Like, so I'd rather have people have low expectations and then be pleasantly surprised if they're selected. Not selected, that's self-explanatory. And then denied would really only be if there's anything fraudulent. So again, if um, the employer submits you for multiple registrations, that would be considered fraudulent. Um, and that would result in a denial. So what can you do here is know that your um, employer or the firm that they have chosen to work with will let you know as soon as they know uh, what the result is. If you've been selected, you'll know right away. If you've not been selected or you're in the submitted result, they'll let you know right away and what else to expect. Um, and again, just a little extra patience as they are working with many clients and it's just, it's a busy time all around. Okay. So, um, end of June is the deadline. So from March or early April, late March, when the lottery happens, let's just, for the sake of this conversation, let's say that you are selected in the lottery. Definitely time to celebrate, be excited, um, all those great things. So the or USCIS requires that the actual H-1B petition then be filed within 90 days of being selected. So that generally comes out to be the end of June, depending on when the lottery happens. Um, there are two options, standard processing and then premium processing. Um, the last time I checked towards the end of June with standard processing, it was taking around two to four weeks, roughly. That varies day to day, honestly. So um, you can, some employers choose standard processing. Some employers will offer to cover the cost of premium processing. Premium processing is um, only available for certain petitions. Um, not available for everything. It is something that's available for the H-1B, which is great. And what it is, is for an extra $2,500, uh, USCIS will adjudicate your petition, meaning they'll look at it and issue a decision within 15 federal working business days. So it's just an expedited processing. Um, I will say that your employer is required to pay for the filing fees, any attorney um, fees for assembling the petition, all of that, they are required to pay for it. If your employer says, no, you have to pay for it, that's the red flag and contact an attorney. Um, what the employer is not required to pay is premium processing. So if your employer says, we're not going to cover the cost, but you're very adamant that you want this done right away, you can uh, choose to pay that $2,500 to have it filed in premium processing if you choose. Again, not required. So when the petition is filed, USCIS will issue a receipt notice, and um, that will be a I-797 and then a C next to it. That is the receipt notice that uh, we'll give you the receipt number, which is three letters followed by 10 numbers, um, and what you can 
use to track the process or the progress of your petition on USCIS's website. You would enter in that receipt number and then they'll give you an update of where it is in the process. That receipt number is really just letting you know that USCIS has received the petition and they're working on it. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't offer anything. It's not a benefit for anything. It's just them confirming, yep, we got it. We're working on it. The approval notice, however, is the I-797A, which is what you can see right here. This is an actual um, approval notice of one of my clients. Obviously, um, protected information is, is covered, but as you can see, this individual was selected in the lottery. Um, their receipt number would be at the top. It shows the receipt or received date. So that's the date that USCIS received the petition. The notice date, which is the notice, um, like when this notice was printed. You have the class type, the I-129, the H-1B petition. Um, you'll see your sponsoring employer for a national name. And then as you can see right here, the bottom right, you can see approval notice H-1B valid from 10-1-2023 to 9-30-2026. So um, keep in mind, that although your H-1B has been approved, it will not go into effect until the start of a new government fiscal year, which is 10-1. So if you are on an F-1 OPT, STEM OPT, you would continue that employment authorization until your H-1B takes effect on 10-1. So what can you do in this scenario? is um, the actual approval notice, this I-797A, that is printed on a different type of paper. It's thicker, it looks fancier. At the bottom, it's gonna come with a um, paper I-94 on there. It is a very important piece of paper, the whole thing. It will be sent to you. Um, and what you need to do is make sure you don't lose it. Make sure you keep it, make sure you know where it is, make sure it's in a safe place. Um, you can keep an electric electronic copy as well, but you'll need this very important approval notice for renewing a driver's license or taking out a loan. You may be asked to um, provide proof. So keep track of this approval notice. I have had clients lose uh, notices and need new ones. It costs, well, last time I looked, it costs $500 to request it, and it takes USCIS over a year. It's ridiculous. So don't lose it. All right, moving on. So October 1st, you got there. So like I said, start of the new government fiscal year. That's when your H-1B takes effect. So if you were on F1 STEM OPT all the way up to September 30th, you will then be on considered um, on H1B. So the huge things I want to call out here is the time between when you received the approval. Okay, so in this case, this person, 526, 2023, that's when it was approved to when it takes effect in October 1st. Hugely important. Do not exit the US and do not change employers. Okay. So, in that limbo time, if you exit the US during that time, even if you have a valid F1 stamp um, and you could technically travel, USCIS is going to see that as you abandoning your lottery selection. So, unless there is a dire need for you to travel, Please stay put. Please stay in the U.S. Don't don't risk it. The odds of being selected in the lottery are tough, and if you got selected, don't jeopardize that. If you must 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 travel, talk with an attorney first. Um, if you know you might have to travel even before you're selected in the lottery, talk with an attorney. See if there's any any ways that um, they can manage that or or do something different for you. Okay. Um, I had a client once that they were selected the first year they were entered in the lottery, which is awesome. Um, 
and they didn't let me know, but they had an opportunity to go to the Tokyo Olympics and do some type of work over there. So a huge opportunity, really awesome. I mean, who wouldn't want to go um, see, you know, Olympic games, right? And I said, hey, look, if you travel during this period, you are jeopardizing your H-1B selection. It will be denied. It will be revoked. Don't do it. It's like, but you know what? That's that's your call. That's up to you. And ultimately they decided to go and um, they ended up separating from the employer regardless. So I'm, I'm not sure what happened as a result, but again, unless it is absolutely dire, please, please stay put. Um, and then don't change employment during that time either. So your H-1B lottery selection is for that employer. If you change, again, USCIS is going to think that you are, um, you are like rejecting that selection and they're, they're not going to, they're not going to, uh, um, count it as an approval anymore. So stay in the U.S., don't change employers. Um, quick time check, Jenna. It's 12. Yes. One. Uh, yes. Uh, I'll go faster. Okay, good. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, H1 petition assembly, the labor conditions um, application, like I said, filed with the DOL, usually takes about seven to 10 days for the DOL to certify it. Uh, the I-129 is the actual petition that gets submitted to USCIS. Uh, so in the order that your representative or attorney is going to do it, they're going to do the LCA, they're going to do the I-129, they're going to gather supporting documentation and file everything with USCIS. Roughly by the time your employer or attorney has all the information uh, that they need from you and the employer, it takes roughly about six weeks from start to approval. Um, what you can do is make sure that you provide all the necessary information, documentation when, when requested, so that this timeline doesn't uh, get it extended. Okay, request for evidence. Um, so let's talk about what it is and what it isn't. Okay, so what it is, is really the USCIS officer just needs additional information before they issue the result. And when you receive the RFE notice, and again, here's a, an example of an actual notice that um, one of my clients has received. It's so many words. It looks complicated. It looks intimidating. What you, the USCIS officer does, it's like a plug, plug and play. They say, I need more information on this. They have templates of letters. So it's going to say, hey, we need this. Here are the various different ways that you can respond to it. So it looks intimidating. Don't worry about it. It's just a lot of words. Um, what it isn't, it is not an indicator of case result. By getting an RFE, it doesn't mean that your, your petition is going to be denied or rejected or anything like that. And it's not a reflection of competence. It doesn't mean that your employer or um, attorney did anything wrong. Um, and it's not something to panic over. It is truly just, hey, we just need a little more information. Help us out here. So what can you do? First, don't panic. Um, let the your employer and attorney uh, read over the RFE and come up with a strategy. Don't do anything before they come up with a strategy. It'll just be wasted time on your part. They'll let you know what they need to come up with a, um, a solid response. Okay, a couple speed bumps. Um, the lottery, what if you run out of chances? You know, you're on F1 OPT, you move to STEM OPT, you got three years. Maybe you were entered three years and you weren't selected. So what, what if you run out of chances? That's a potential speed bump. Uh, the H-1B, so the approval again is based on the LCA. So if there is a change into the, change with the employment information that's on the LCA, the, your employer may need to file an H-1B amendment, which is really just the same as a regular petition. It's just checking a different box. Um, and then international travel. So with the H-1B, you when you exit the U.S., you'll have to go for visa stamping to 
re-enter the U.S. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. And then permanent residency, when you start uh, with a company, let's say on F1 OPT, and they, you know, they say they're going to enter you in the lottery. There's a lot of strategic planning to then simultaneously look at permanent residency and that timeline and that approach. So don't be discouraged if the employer says, hey, let's pause a little bit on initiating initiating the your permanent residency process. You know, here's the strategy. We want to try and mitigate any potential for um, an audit or uh, potential you know, RFEs, things like that. We want to make your permanent residency plan through employment as solid as possible. So don't get discouraged that way. Okay, lastly, applying and interviewing. I know this is a really, really big struggle for many of our F1 students. Um, the infamous sponsorship question on applications, will you now or in the future require sponsorship for employment visa status? This is a twofold question. Will you now require it? Well, no, no, I'm on F1 OPT. I'm on F1 STEM OPT right now. No, I don't require sponsorship. But what happens after the conclusion of your STEM OPT? Then what? What do you have planned? What's, what are you gonna do now? So that's really the question. You don't need it now, but you're gonna need it in the future. So it is, um, it is suggested and advised that you would select yes, unless you know for certain that you have a plan following um, your STEM OPT uh, authorization, such as maybe you're getting married and you'll be receiving your green card well before then, or you don't plan on staying in the US, you plan on returning to your home country, things like of that nature, unless you know for certain answer yes to that question. So a um, couple things that you can ask prospective employers is, will you be entered in the upcoming lottery? Um, and then subsequent lotteries, if you're not selected that first round, um, you wanna leverage as many opportunities and many chances as you possibly can. In addition to your visa, your H-1B visa, will a company also sponsor your eligible dependents? So again, spouse, any eligible uh, children, um, for that H-4 visa. Uh, will eligible petitions be filed in premium processing? Some employers will automatically file in premium, some may not. Again, like I mentioned before, you have the option to add it on if and cover the cost yourself if you want. And then does the company sponsor for the green card your permanent residency and when would that begin? Uh, so some companies say right away, immediately, some companies want to say, hey, six months, some are a year. It's just good for you to know what the typical um, process is so that you can manage expectations. Okay, so in the interest of time, I, I really flew through those last slides. So I'm good to open it up for, for questions. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Jenna, for such a thorough discussion on H-1B. Um, as much as you think you know about immigration, there will be like one or two things that you hear in some off conversation that completely derails your understanding and you question the entire knowledge base that you had of immigration. So uh, for me, it was today, you know, learning that you should not leave the U.S. Uh, between the time you get H-1 and the time you are employed and you have it in hand and how important it is to not lose these receipts. As a matter of fact, uh, if you don't and if you are an international student, I would encourage you to um, follow this person who, you know, this is what always happens. I will gas up somebody and I will forget their name. Uh, she is a, an international student coach. Uh, so Nidhi Nagori, yeah, 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 Nidhi Nagori, and she recently made a video why she left the U.S. for Canada and cited multiple reasons, had her own personal ones, but one of the things that she said was how her immigration forms got lost, and it was not because of her fault and how that derailed her entire employment 
uh, and she found that form in some like deep corner of a U.S. post office or some something like that. So and when Jenna was talking about not losing these forms, lest you have to give out five hundred dollars more um, over the twenty five hundred dollars and all other expenses, that really hurts. So you know you you better be safe than sorry and i'm so thankful that jenna did not hold any punches back in and giving us a transparent view of what immigration is with that uh, i know people have tons of questions uh if you can just raise your hand and i will go through the list um one by one i know some questions were also asked in the chat but this is your chance you have 20 minutes to uh, talk with immigration paralegals and get their advice. So go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. And I'll go through the list one by one. Uh, all right, uh, Aman, go for it. And please keep your questions to one per person. And if we have more time, we'll come back to you. Aman. Thanks a lot. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes. Okay, so um, I wanted to ask like, uh, when you apply for an H-1B, it's basically with an employer and with a specific position, right? So uh, what if my master's degree is, in this? so in my case, my master's degree is in robotics, but I want to, let's say, go into software development or something very similar to it, but not exactly like that. Mm -hmm. So at what time do I face any problem? Because during the CPT, I remember, uh, the IEEE department was telling me that uh, you have to explain your case. How, like, yeah. I work in computer vision, so they're like, yeah, this doesn't explain at all how it is related to robotics. So can you uh, shed some light on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a really good question. So um, your degree would apply to a software engineer or engineering type position. Um, the way that the employer or at least I would approach it, would be to, uh, within the job description that is submitted with the LCA is, in the job description, I'll say, you know, requirements, uh, minimum education, it would be minimum education, let's just say a master's degree in MIS, in software engineering, in um, elect electrical engineering, or other related fields. So, it doesn't actually have to be in those four that I just said. It could be robotics. And within the job description, it'll lay out what the job duties will be. And perhaps it is more robotics focused or you know, central, then um then it can like tick and tie between what the job is looking for and what you possess through your education. Now in that case, though, don't be surprised if an RFE is, is issued. And it could be that the USCIS officer wants to see um, your transcript and the, the um, courses that you took, which would apply to the work that you would be doing. So don't worry so much on that, on what you need to do. That would be more of the strategy of your employer and the attorney. Got it. So I wanted to ask uh, if it could be a sub part of my degree or not. Like, uh, like computer vision is in robotics, but it, it, like I don't see many people looking at it that way. So I'm sorry. What is the sub? It's uh, like uh, robotics has a sub part which is computer vision. Oh, and, okay. Uh, most of the people don't know that. And that's why I'm asking because uh, in the IEEE as well, I have to explain them. So is it the same case with US, USCIS? Yes, it may be. Don't be surprised if it is. Okay. Yep. Got it. Got it. All right, Monaza. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Aman. Uh, all right. Uh, Monaza and then Akriti. Uh, thank you, uh, Aditi, and thank you, Jenna, for the wonderful talk. So, like, uh, my question, uh, it pertains to my situation right now. Uh, I am on F1 OPT, and I recently started that. So, and I'm working with, like, uh, an academic uh, institution where I'm doing a postdoc. So, 
I spoke to my employer and they say that they will sponsor my H1B once my STEM OPT is exhausted. And uh, so because I'm on STEM OPT, so I get like three years, like one year and then two years extension. So mm -hmm. I think that is like a normal situation or what would you recommend someone? Because like my only fear is that uh, in, you know, I hear retrogression and everything going on like so commonly these days. So do you think like this would be like a normal situation for somebody? Uh, yes, but you know, I would I would advise that you ask your employer to clarify what they mean on they will sponsor your H1B at the conclusion of your STEM OPT and ask, does that mean that your employer will enter you in the lottery for the three times that you're, you're eligible or are they going to wait until uh, the conclusion of your STEM OPT to, or, you know, that last year of STEM OPT to enter you? I think um, this that they will wait until my OPT uh, is over and then they'll start the processing of like H1B. So I think it's like they will start the lottery after that. So do you think that's an ideal situation for me? Um, I would I would get clarification. And if that is truly the case, I would uh, try and um, push to be entered in the lottery as many times as you can not, not, and not to wait based on, on um, odds of being selected. Did you want you want to take all opportunities you can? Yeah. Okay. Because how is how is she even going to be in this country if her STEM OPT expires, right? Like right. you need you need to have something to retain you in this country because mm -hmm. STEM OPT after that expires, then you're and what? Out of the country, right? Like yeah. you're done. Um, so just like, you know, when you get an H1B and if you don't have your green card petition approved by the sixth year of H-1B, then again, you're out of the country. So whichever status you are on, and Jenna, I don't want to immigration explain this, uh, but in my mind, like whichever status you're on, you have to have a vi valid status after that for you to, to, to continue living in the US. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I'm into it and I don't like know a lot. So that's why I'm attending all these master classes and clarifying my doubts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, go with what Jenna said that like ask them to enter you because entering in the lottery and getting H1B are different. Uh, if you need yeah, to that's important. All those, yeah, all those chances. Akriti and Sri Ram, go for it. Akriti first and then Sri Ram. Uh, hi, Jenna. Thank you so much for sharing all the information about the H1B visa. So I did enter the lottery this year, but I wasn't picked, unfortunately. And because I'm not on a STEM OPD program and my OPD expires in January, we're now looking for other options and other ways for me to extend my stay in the U.S. Sure. Uh, so a concurrent visa is something that my employer is looking into. I wanted to know how recommended going down that path is and if it somehow affects my chances in the H-1B lottery for the coming up years. Um, you said a concurrent visa? Yes. So they're looking at a situation where I'll be employed by a, my employer A is going to be someone who is H-1B cap exempt. So maybe TAing at, an, at a university. And then employer B will be someone who needs an H-1B visa. Got it. Got it. That is an option. Yeah, that's that's a, a viable option. There there shouldn't be any risk to subsequent lottery entrance or registrations. It, it shouldn't um, impact your odds of being selected in, in future years. That mm -hmm. is certainly an option. Another option, you know, I don't want to presume or anything, but if you are married to... Um, and your spouse is on H-1B, you could, well, that's not important. Well, I'm, I'm not married, yeah. but that would definitely be an easy fix, but that's right. not uh, the case. But uh, just because everybody goes uh, back to their F-1 visa status and continues school and the concurrent visa is not something a lot of people do. So that is yeah. the question that I had in my mind. Yeah, you know, it, it is um, a viable option. Um, it's not something that I have, personal experience with with my clients but definitely talk to an attorney about it and see um what their thoughts are okay thank you so much of course awesome uh sri ram
Okay. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. I did not unmute my mic. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um. Okay. Um. Um. Okay. Um. Hi, Aditi and Jenna. Thank you for the amazing um presentation H one B. I really appreciate it. My quick question is, I'm doing my master's degree right now, but I won't graduate till May 2024. So my question is, if I were to find an employer who's willing to sponsor my H-1B, um, and so let's say the employer sponsor or files the H-1B lottery in next March, then in that case, will I be counted as the bachelor's degree cap or the master's degree cap? Because technically, I won't have a master's degree um, like until May of 2024. But I did my undergrad all in the US and I'm currently here on F1 visa. So that's a really good question. You would be uh you would not be I counted was towards if, do you know the answer? Yep. Uh really, really good question. You would not be counted um towards the master's um part yeah. of the lottery. Okay. Um I would be talk with an attorney. Um the position that you are being offered through your employer. Does it require a minimum of bachelor's degree or does it require a minimum of a master's degree? Um, if it's a bachelor's degree, you're fine. If it's a master's mm -hmm. degree, that could be scrutinized if you were selected and then the petition uh, and, and you're then you file the petition where the uh, position says a uh, minimum of master's, but you don't have your master's yet. So, okay. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. Neil, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so, based on your experience, uh, what is your view on this second lottery for the H one B this year? Ah, uh, yes. Um, we should hopefully find out if USCIS will conduct a second lottery or not sometime in the coming week, but definitely before the end of this month. Um, and it's not often that USCIS will even announce that they're going to do a second lottery. It'll just be all of a sudden, hey, we did another lottery check the status type thing. So I don't know, we'll have to wait and see. Thank you. Sure. Let's go for, uh, so Ananya asked me a question in the chat. She said that if I did not get the H1B lottery, how can I stay back as an F1 student in STEM OPT final year? Uh, I think, so, didn't get selected, your final year STEM OPT, um, talk with an attorney to see if there are any other options. So what I've done with my clients, um, in their particular situation, they didn't have any alternatives. So they chose on their own to return to school for another program to go back onto F1 to continue uh, their, um, their status here in, in the U.S and then try their luck at the lottery the next year. And thankfully, I have only had two clients that had to do that, and um, they were then selected on that fourth year. So that was good, but. Okay, um, seven more minutes. So we have Dhananjay, Varsha, and Karina. Oh, I can go in. Thanks, Aditi, and thanks, Jenna, for yeah. that particular session. And so uh, when you talked about uh, you know strategic and other planning which would be needed for a green card application once you are on h1b so mm -hmm. addressing to that point how soon can one apply for a green card petition once you are on h1b anything that you know one needs to wait for before they should apply for it and in general the processing time that can be expected in that entire process yeah oh gosh you know we only have six minutes left and I could spend hours on this. Um, so I think the biggest hurdle would be for new graduates would be not having professional experience following, you know, after their, their degree, that's going to be the most challenging piece. Um, so let me take a, a software engineer, for example, if the requirements minimum requirement is a bachelor's degree, um, plus five years of experience, even if you were working during, while you were obtaining your bachelor's degree, uh, the Department of Labor and USAS, they're not going to count that. They're only going to count experience following your bachelor's degree. So 
professional experience is going to be, um, I think the first hurdle and in addition, don't let that discourage you. Um, so it may not be, it may not start right away. Um, it, your employer may say, let's pause, let's get you some experience first, and then let's, let's talk about it. So Jenna, I do have professional experience, like more than 10 years. So maybe if that might help. Uh, yeah, potentially. Again, it would be uh, an individual basis. I would need to, you know, look at your whole history and and things like that, um, and then go from there. Definitely talk with an attorney. They can look at your entire situation and see uh, what what a good strategy would be. Sure. Thanks, Jenna. Sure. Um, Varsha and last, Karina. Hi, Jenna. Hi, Aditi. Uh, so my question was, uh, uh, so right now I'm on my F1 CPT visa and uh, I'd be graduating this December. So I just wanted to know uh, what, like, how long exactly OPT is and what is that three months job duration period and what exact and how many years do we have the STEM OPT? Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, quickly on that. Absolutely. Sure. So OPT is optional practical training at the conclusion. Once you receive your, your degree and you graduate, you can go on OPT as long as you have a, a, a job offer in the same field as what you graduated with. Um, and that is for 12 months of employment authorization for that employer. Uh, I would then I recommend um, for those that are in a STEM field, 180 days um, before your OPT expires, you want to apply for STEM OPT, which will grant you an additional 24 months of employment authorization, as long as it's same field, same um, you know work that you'll be doing as what you graduated with. So you could have a total of three years of employment authorization through the F1 programs. Okay, thank you. Um, before, uh, like, uh, we take Karina's question, there were um, a couple of questions where people have asked, what happens after six years of H-1B, if you can shed some light on that? Yes. So um, after six years, if you don't already have something in place, and I'll touch on that in a second, then you'll have to leave the U.S. Um, and you can then stay outside the U.S. for a year and then um, return. So what you can do to eliminate that six year max stay is look at the employment based green card process through your employer. So at the beginning of this conversation, I said, you know, a lot of these folks, a lot of you are, are looking at EB1 and looking at that strategy. Wouldn't you also want somebody else working on your behalf through another path to get to the green card? And that would be the employment-based green card process. There's three main milestones, the PERM, the I-140, and the adjustment of status. And once you get that approved I-140, that's what eliminates that six-year max stay, which then will allow you to continue to extend your H-1B indefinitely or until you're able to file your adjustment of status to get your green card. So a lot of timing and strategy goes into planning that. And again, I could spend hours talking about that. Yeah. Um, what the strategy, like, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jenna, is after one year of staying on your H-1B, that's when uh, you start the conversation or your employer, either from you or the employer, uh, you start the conversation of your green card uh, primarily they they if you're a master's or a, like you know ma master's students, the typical international student uh, portfolio would go to mm -hmm. EB2 employment based second preference mm -hmm. and through that uh, lane you go through like Jenna said perm and then I140 now with perm uh, it takes it's taking 1.5 to two years according to words on the street yeah. like it's taking a long time to get the perm um, and shit can hit the fan because they are migrating to a new system that they have never tried before so if you are in user research you know what a travesty it is to roll out a 
a product without ever trying it on users. So that's what USCIS is doing. So that could throw a monkey wrench in your plan. And after that perm is done, then your I-140 gets processed. And after that, you get into the 120 year wait to uh, do the adjustment of status. So the last yeah. part is where the whole backlog uh, kicks in. So yeah. that's the trajectory of Indian nationals. Uh, so, and that's what Jenna was talking about that like, you know, a lot of strategy goes into when do you have to select, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. Karina, uh, go, for, go for your question. But before I end with Karina, Jenna, if you can, because me and, when me and you were talking, you touched upon something which I didn't know. And I think folks will really appreciate is how renewing H1B can affect your career promotions. Uh, yes. There was this one example you took how you advised somebody to like postpone their promotion until they got their H1B renewed. So I would love for you to share that with folks. If it, folks can just stay back for another five or seven minutes after Karina's question, um, I think you will really benefit from uh, what Jenna would have to say. Karina, go for it. Thank you. Uh, so I work for a small startup and they've been very helpful. I'm on a non dual intent visa um, and I wanted to bring forward. The thing is, they have no legal knowledge. It's like we don't know who to ask and how to get a lawyer all the time. Um, okay. and I wanted to just pitch the idea at some point of maybe applying for H1B, but with the specific intent also of the green card as well, like as a pattern sure. evaluate. Um, and I need to kind of give them a quote, like, even though it's very ballpark, like, mm -hmm. what could they expect to spend? And maybe like, in what time frame? because they have to raise, they're privately funded, right? So they would have to get money for that, too. Sure. That's a good question. Um, and, you know, you're doing the right thing by thinking ahead and knowing what visa you're on, that it's, uh, it does not offer dual intent and how to go to HB. You're doing all the right things. What I tell my business partners, and now granted, I work with um, an external firm that's a, a very large firm. So uh, costs can vary from firm to firm. But I tell my business partners that when we have to do a petition for one of their um, associates, that they can anticipate $5,500 without premium. And then I would say seventy-five to 8000 with premium processing. To file to assemble and file a petition. And that's that's filing fees, attorney fees, things like that. But again, different firms have different um, attorney fees. But you could use that as ballpark. That, that's really great, right? Awesome. All right. I think that wraps up all our questions. Before we give the floor to Jenna, uh, I did want to share Jenna's LinkedIn. Uh, please, if you uh, can take this moment to thank Jenna, uh, she took her time from her day and believe it or not, we have been going through like thank, like between each other, we're like, Jenna, like people are not registering. How can we drill down the importance of knowing like, you know, what is H1B? So all, if you go back to my LinkedIn, all the posts that I've made this week have been motivated by that conversation. So we could attract more folks to these very, very important conversations and how to get more clarity. Um, so if you want to thank Jenna over here, or if you can reach out to Jenna because she truly uh, took all the feedback that I was providing to her and she retweaked and retweaked the slides um, to what you see today. So I am so, so appreciative of Jenna spending time with us. And I'm so proud of you um, to take the first bold step in gaining clarity about uh, your, your future because whether you choose to stay here or not, please be aware of all your rights and, uh, and and make informed decisions. The second thing that I want to share is the Slack community that we have in place. Uh, if you are curious about um, pathways to permanent residency, especially merit-based visas like O1, EB2, NIW, and EB1, that is the place to be. Uh, we have over 2,388 immigrants working together, having honest and deep conversations, trying to help each other out, uh, build better profiles so we can eventually secure um, our sec secure our future in this country. Uh, and thirdly, uh, we have uh, the next event coming up next week. And uh, it's going to be an O1 success story. Uh, O1 is 
becoming a non-immigrant visa that is an antidote to H-1B, uh, you can secure an O-1 visa based on your merit. There is no chance, there is no lottery. Uh, so a lot of folks are looking at building their O-1 profiles, especially folks who are international students who are in their first year of being an international student, almost going to graduate, or their OPT is kicking in and now they are realizing, oh my gosh, like H-1B is a crapshoot, what do I do? Let's qualify for O-1. So we have Akansha Kulshrestha uh, coming and talking to us next weekend. So if you want to be a part of that, join the Slack community. I'll share more information. All right, Jenna, tell us that story so we can uh, yes. wrap up our, our, our talk today. Yes, yes. So um, the, the question was, um, I had a client that was up for promotion. Um, to clarify, it was an individual, they were moving from individual contributor to uh, a people leader. So they were going to have direct reports. Now, this comes while they're working on their H-1B and their H-1B, that's a material change. You're going from individual contributor to uh, a people manager. So we would have to file an amendment. Simultaneously, we were working on their perm and their perm was processing. So we're working on two different things, but at the same time. And to make that material change would impact their perm. And we did not want to delay that anymore than necessary. So I had a conversation with their leaders. I had a conversation with the associate. And I said, hey, look, if we do this now, it's going to um, impact your perm. It's going to set you back. And we're going to have to essentially start from scratch. Um, but if we wait until your perm is approved, which at that point, I think it was maybe six months, three months, something like that. It wasn't a crazy long time. So, but if we wait until your perm is approved and then you get your promotion and we file that H-1B amendment, that will not delay your uh, employment-based green card process. We won't have to start that over. So there may be times where your employer or your attorney might say, hey, don't take that promotion just wait a little bit. I promise you, they're not trying to derail your career progression. It is, there's a reason, there's a purpose. They don't want to impact other areas of your immigration journey. So uh, don't be discouraged by that. Just ask questions to ask what their thoughts are and why, uh, so you can have a better understanding. Awesome. I hope that answers it. Yes, oh my gosh, so, so important. Uh, immigration and profession. And in the middle, we stand. All yeah. right. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, reach out to Jenna. Reach out to me. Always happy to chat. But thank you again for making time for yourselves uh, and for investing in your future. So proud. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Jenna. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>